They minister the corporal works of mercy to more than 50,000 people every year in the mission territory of Tulsa, Oklahoma. We'll find out what keeps Catholic Charities of Tulsa going strong tonight. So please stay with us. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packer and welcome to EWTN Live, our chance to bring you guests from all over the world. But before we get to tonight's guest, I want to mention that today is the feast of the dedication of the Church of St. John Lateran. This is a new church today, but it, the original church went back to the fourth century, the 300s. And it's a great celebration because the Emperor Constantine, gave St. John Lateran to the Pope to be the cathedral church of the city of Rome. And this marked the end of the Roman persecutions. Right before Constantine, there had been terrible persecution of the church. It was the last but the worst of the persecutions. And many people were still alive who remembered that persecution. But this church being given to the Pope showed that the Roman Empire was not able to withstand the power of the Catholic Church. And we need to have this story clear in our minds so that when we perceive that there are various opponents to the church, that we have to remember they will pass away like the Roman Empire did like the Nazis did, like the communists did, and one group after another, and we are going to come out with our faith intact. So let's celebrate that great feast today. Now, for our guests, tonight they come all the way from the edge of the Great Plains, where the Diocese of Tulsa, Oklahoma, is mission territory for the Catholic Church. But the faith is gaining a strong foothold in the region, thanks in part to our guests. So please welcome the Bishop of the Diocese of Tul Tulsa and the Chairman of Catholic Charities of Tulsa, Bishop Edward Slattery, along with the Executive Director, Deacon Kevin Sartorius, and the Vice Chairman, Mr. Richard Minchall. <laughs> Excellency, welcome. <laughs> Deacon, good to have you. Richard. <laughs> welcome to Alabama. Good to have you. Another mission territory. So it's, it's good to be here. Thank <laughs> good you. to have you here indeed. Uh, we were talking before the show how you're from not only the same city as I, Chicago, but we also went to the same uh, minor seminary for high school. That's right. Quigley Preparatory Seminary. That's right. And you went to north or south? Uh, north, because the south hadn't been built yet. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. Well, I went to the north too. Yeah. yeah, so it's good to have you here. And Deacon, where are you from? Well, I was born in Wichita, Kansas, but I've lived most of my life in Oklahoma. So uh, I'm very happy to be here as well. Beautiful fall leaves. How about you, Richard? Where are you from? I'm from Tulsa. Our family's been there, believe it or not, for 111 years. So you're back with the Sooners. Oh, you know, the, well, the, they, they were a little bit before us. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, good to have you all here. Welcome. Now, we want to talk tonight about Catholic Charities. And practically every diocese has a Catholic Charities. Why should we talk about yours, Excellency? Mm -hmm. Well, our Catholic Charities, we think, is uh, special. Okay. And uh, because uh, God has been very, very good to us. First of all, when I came to Tulsa about 18 years ago, I inherited a very wonderful situation because uh, we had these different agencies that help the poor in different ways, and they were all separated from one another, and they were in these very old dilapidated buildings and I realized right away that uh, something had to be done, but we had, didn't have any money. So um, 
Uh, some years later, uh, we got the idea that we should bite the bullet and see if we could raise some money to, uh, to consolidate all of these under one, in one campus. And uh, that's quite a Herculean task for a diocese our size. Uh, so we prayed about it and dedicated the uh, entire endeavor to our Blessed Mother and asked her if she would help us do this. And so we raised nearly $20 million uh, with a Catholic population of um, uh, maybe 60,000 60, registered Catholics. And now we have about 60,000 more who are Hispanic. So we're a small diocese on a large area of 26,000 square miles. So anyway, we did, we, we had a campaign and we, we raised the money and now it's built. And two years ago, that is uh, December, the, on the Feast of, uh, of the Immaculate Conception, two years ago, we, we dedicated it. And now it's operating and it's doing very, very well. One of the other features- Where, where is it exactly? Well, it's on the north side of the, uh, of the diocese, of, of okay. the city of Tulsa, city of Tulsa. So, so that it's accessible to the people who will be using it. Okay. And so it's easier for them to get there. Sure. Sure. And uh, they come, and they come in great numbers. And as we talk, you're going to find out that we uh, last year serviced 50,000 people, most of them non-Catholic. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a truly Catholic charities. That is, the people who work there, who are employed, are uh, are Catholic. And um, uh, the, the the genius of it all is that um, it's truly religious because. Uh, we have 2,500 volunteers. So it's really volunteer driven. And that means that the people coming from different parishes are personally involved in the work of Catholic Charities. And they all feel, and they express this all the time, very rewarded. At the center of our Catholic Charities is a beautiful chapel, which itself was a million dollars to build. And uh, we have mass there every day for anyone who wants to come. And uh, that is having an enormous effect on the way in which all of our people uh, deal with the poor who come. They're, they're, uh, we deal with them with um, uh, acknowledging their great dignity as human beings. And so- uh, That they're not merely clients. No. You know, no. for a social service, they're, they're brothers and sisters in Christ. Exactly, and, and everyone knows this and they're conscious of it all the time because we pray. We pray and celebrate Mass uh, every day. Great. Deacon, uh, what exactly do you do with this, with Catholic Charities? Well, it depends on who you ask, I suppose. Uh, but I'm going to ask you, and I'm going to see what your story oh, okay. is, and we'll make some comparisons oh, later. I, see. Uh, I am uh, the executive director, and so I'm uh, charged uh, by Bishop and Mr. Mitchell with carrying out the day-to-day -day operations. I uh, am a spiritual leader for the uh, campus, uh, as a deacon uh, in service and charity. That is my role as a deacon. Uh, but also I uh, help to uh, plan and, and carry out the programs that we offer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we really work to try and uh, deal with the whole person with their material needs, which is typically why they present themselves. They come with a need. Uh, it may be that they're homeless. It may be that their mouth is hurting and they need dental care. Uh, but they present themselves and then we try and work with them to explore what are all of their needs. Mm -hmm. uh, all of their material needs, but also their spiritual needs. Mm -hmm. uh, and we do it in a way that's uh, very caring and very loving. We don't proselytize, we're not forcing anything. Uh, but people, in the end, uh, when, when I ask them, how did, we, how did we help you today? They don't say, you gave me groceries or you gave me a filling. Uh, what they say is that uh, you gave me hope, uh, or you, 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 look, you guys will really care for me. Uh, they understand Christ's love through our corporal works. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is, we're only successful when that's what we're doing. Uh, because their material needs will come and go, eventually they will die. Uh, but for all eternity, uh, through an opportunity for us to serve them, they might have eternal life. And what do you do? Well. Uh, my main role has been uh, when we built the campus. Mm -hmm. My wife and I chaired that capital campaign. We raised over $19 million, all from private donors. We That's don't raise any money from the government or uh, a United Way. It's all from private donors. And uh, amazing amount of money in that little 
mm -hmm. diocese yes, to is. raise to do this, but uh, we were able to do it. And uh, and I'm vice chairman of the board. <laughs> okay. But I would I would say one thing too about Kevin and the staff. Kevin is of course the leader. But that staff of 33 people served over 50,000 people last year. And if you knew them, you'd see that it's not a job, it's a vocation. They're dedicated to what they do, and that makes a huge difference. And that's why Kevin was describing that we give them more than just what they need. And when they leave Catholic Charities, they've been treated with care and dignity, and they go away with hope as well. Mm -hmm. And that is really valuable. Yeah. Now you mentioned a couple of the things that you do concretely with them. Yes. Um, getting them dental care. Do you have dentists who donate time or something? Sure. Uh, as Richard said, we have only 33 full-time employees and then we have about 30 part-time employees and then 2,500 volunteers. So we don't have a dentist on staff, but we have 25 dentists who volunteer their time. Mm -hmm. We have dental hygienists who come in and serve. Uh, we have a few paid attorneys for our immigration staff, but we also have volunteer attorneys for our immigration program. Uh, Caseworkers for emergency services, people who work in the warehouse with clothing and food, uh, all kinds of programs, professional counseling services. So the volunteers come with their own skills and they make those available to help the poor doing what they know how to do. That's right, but I would say first they come with their own needs. Uh, they come- The volunteers? Absolutely. How uh, so? Well, they have a, a, a baptismal calling. Uh, they have a need to serve other people, and uh, we recognize that, and so we give them an opportunity uh, to give themselves, not just to give the skills that they have, but to give themselves uh, to the people that they serve. Mm -hmm. And when they give themselves, then the dentistry or the immigration uh, law work or bagging the groceries, working in the clothing center, then those things have fruit. Uh, if they only come to help someone try on a coat and go off and be warm, uh, but they don't give them love, it, it really doesn't, it doesn't work. It's not what our mission is. Our, our, our mission is to be Christ's merciful love to those who suffer. Our mission isn't to give someone a coat. Our mission yeah. is to give them Christ's love. Now giving them the coat is tangible. Absolutely. You can quantify the coat, the food, and the dental care, and all mm -hmm. the rest. Mm -hmm. But how do you communicate to the volunteers that we also are asking you to give your love and yourself uh, and your faith, you know, in this situation? How do you do that? That only comes from prayer. And these volunteers are practically all Catholic who are active parishioners in their parishes and Catholic Charities is promoted throughout the diocese. And these people come from these different parishes and they come there with the idea of receiving, uh, receiving a, a way to fulfill their vocation as Christians. And they're grateful for that. Mm -hmm. So for well, when you talk to the volunteers. The, the, the volunteers are grateful. Yes, the volunteers are grateful. If, when you talk to them, they'll tell you one after the other that um, they receive more than they give. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it, it comes down to what our, uh, our Pope Benedict said in his encyclical, God is Love, uh, when he said that we can never, when we do something for another person, uh, we can never feel superior or feel uh, higher. We only say that we've done what we're supposed to do as the, from the, from the yeah, Gospels. Yeah, we just had that Gospel the other day. Yeah. You know, so we're just useless servants. We're just we're useless servants. And, and not only that, but when a person begins to give themselves generously in any way at all, especially to the poor, they end up experiencing in their heart enormous gratitude because they know that they're fulfilling their vocation. Mm -hmm. And this is, so we have a need uh, to fulfill our baptismal uh, calling, which is to love. And that's what they do. And that's how they know. It's through prayer. Uh, it's through prayer in the Eucharist. And then finally, uh, giving themselves generously to others. Father, well, on, that, on that point about the volunteers, you know, we just finished this wonderful uh, DVD with EWTN and right. Video Works in Tulsa. And on that DVD is a volunteer uh, who made this statement. She said, you know, on my own, I could help maybe one or two people a year. 
but by being a part of Catholic Charities, I can be part of helping over 50,000 people a year. Mm -hmm. Isn't that great? Yeah, yeah. yeah this, the, the community effort of serving has a ramification. Instead of 2,500 people doing 2,500 good acts, it ends up being 50,000. There, there's something that's, you know, exponential in the effect. Mm -hmm. Right, that's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. And I think they're prepared also uh, by the fact that at our Catholic Charities in Tulsa, we have uh, the Liturgy of the Hours in the morning, uh, then we break at noon for Mass, and then we have Adoration in the afternoon. Uh, the, the Liturgy is an active part of our experience at Catholic Charities. Uh, again, in uh, God is Love, Pope Benedict talks about how the Church is composed of the Word, the Sacraments, and Charity. And all three of those are necessary. They all uh, presuppose each other. Without one, you don't have the full church. And so if you have a Catholic Charities that didn't have the sacraments, you wouldn't have the church. Or if you have a church that doesn't have charity, then you don't have the church either. Uh, we have to maintain this balance of mm -hmm. the word and mm -hmm. the sacrament and charity. I, I think that term balance you know, of all that it means to be Catholic is part of authentic Catholicism. That's right. You know, and that, yeah, that's and what we I need. Think, uh, it's very important for us to uh, recognize that we should never, ever apologize for expressing our faith by loving. On the other hand, we have to be very careful that we never, never disrespect a person, another person's conscience by manipulating them to become Catholic. Let the Holy Spirit do His work. He's involved in this entire process, and the people know that. So we, what our, our obligation is simply to live our faith, to live our faith uh, fully. And, uh, and sure enough, what happens is many people find that the Catholic Church is very attractive because of the way we pray, the way we worship, and the way we love. And that, that is enough to, uh, to pull people into the church without having to push them, you know. Well, see, this is, you know, what we sometimes have heard about in past missions, that there are so-called rice Christians. You give them rice and they'll become a Christian. Yeah. That's not what you're doing. No. You're not bribing people to become Catholic. Not at all. Not only that, but some of our primary support comes from the Jewish community and the Presbyterian community in Tulsa. Very significant support. And I think as Bishop had said earlier, over half the people we serve are not Catholic. Mm -hmm. Being in mission territory, we find that only about 10% of the people in Eastern Oklahoma are Catholic. So right. a lot of people who uh, see the work that we do, they appreciate it and they wanna be a part of it. And so uh, our donor base involves uh, people who are not Catholic. Uh, and uh, even our volunteer base does, because what they, what they find is that the way we serve people is very attractive to them. And uh, conversely, uh, the people who come to us for assistance, the vast majority of them are not Catholic either. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's this, this, this interchange where we are who we are. We are the Catholic Church. Uh, we are not a social service agency. We're the Catholic Church. And as long as we're honest about that and we're upfront about it, uh, then people uh, can choose to be involved with us and know uh, what, the, uh, what they're getting themselves into. If, if I could give an example sure, of that. Sure. We have a, a maternity program uh, where a, a woman will come in and she'll test and if she's pregnant then she'll come back every month and then every week as she gets near term and she's seen by doctors right here on our campus. Uh, ultrasound uh, is being purchased right now as a, a gift from the Knights of Columbus Ultrasound Initiative Great. that's coming through and uh, the state of Oklahoma Knights have raised that money but the doctors are from Oklahoma State University uh, they're from the OBGYN residency program a state school uh, we don't have many Catholic uh, universities in uh, Oklahoma you have any we do have one, one St. Gregory's it's a fine school mm -hmm. Uh, St. Gregory's University is the oldest university in, in Oklahoma. Uh, but OSU provides uh, residents and uh, faculty for that OBGYN program where the women receive maternity care. We told them, we want to be a, a partner with you in this process. 
We would also, though, uh, need to follow the ethical and religious directives of Catholic health care. Uh, we're going to be uh, working with these women to provide natural family planning training. We're going to hire staff, Catholic Charities will, to provide that NFP training. And if you'd like to participate in this, we'd love to have you. And they said, you know what, we're good for that. And so it's a partnership with a, a secular institution. Uh, it's a partnership where they know who we are and they respect who we are and it, it works great. Uh, we just have to be true to our values. Speaking of something secular, you mentioned, Richard, that you, don't, you didn't get money from the federal government. Do you get you know, funds to sustain this work from the government? No. 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 Nor, nor from United Way. Okay. The only thing we get from the government, uh, you can't say nothing because we get a pittance from the State Department through the Council of Catholic Bishops to re relocate refugees in our diocese. Oh, okay. And it works out that it's almost nothing. We have to hire two caseworkers. Two thirds of the money goes to the refugees. Of the third that's left that we get, almost all that goes to the two caseworkers. So it's really a service to the State Department. It's not something we're promoting. Right, right. Catholic and it charities. doesn't, it's not something that sustains and that's Catholic the, charities. That's no. the only money that we receive other than private funds. And so... Uh, well, that, that sounds like that would give you a certain amount of freedom absolutely. from government regulations yeah, right. about, you know, on, on the moral issues, some of their, uh, their Im, sometimes <laughs> immoral yeah. norms. Um, we, have we don't have to worry about it. We don't have to worry about it. In, in Tulsa, we don't, our Catholic Church doesn't, it's not even a concern. We are thoroughly Catholic in our hiring and in the, in the way we operate. Mm -hmm thoroughly Catholic, without any concern about those other issues. Yeah, that, I think that's important. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's why... Because it shows yeah. that even in a small diocese like Tulsa, mm -hmm. I mean, small in terms of the numbers of Catholics, it can be done. It, it can be done. Without right. government subsidies. That's right. And regulations. That's right. Uh, Deacon Kevin, you were going to say something? Well, I think that that, uh, that freedom is something that our, our donors are really proud of as well. We are a very dynamic organization because we respond to the needs of the people we serve and we can rally our parishes, our parish priests, our uh, board members to help us with a project at a, a moment's notice. Uh, we had a, uh, an apartment complex that went bankrupt uh, in Tulsa and uh, the people did not even receive back their housing deposit, uh, their utility deposit. It turns out uh, a very large portion of those people uh, were undocumented. When you bring together all the agencies in Tulsa, many of them will say, you know, we can't help because they're n they're not, they don't have a social security number. Catholic Charities can help because we love every individual and every person has human dignity. Yeah, you don't go by the numbers. And we respond to the person's need uh, not to all of the other bureaucratic mess that happens when you get tied up in government mm -hmm. money. So mm -hmm. ba basically, if you want to come to get help from extension, uh, to, from, uh, to, uh, to uh, Catholic Charities in Tulsa, um, all you have to be is somebody in need. That's all. Yeah. If you're a, if you, you're a human being, you qualify. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. You know, one, one of the things that you were saying before about the volunteers, too, speaking of need, because, again, you, you talked about them as having a need to live out their baptism. Mm -hmm. And that this gives them an opportunity to serve, which is very much a component of who we are as yeah, Christians. It's your identity. Yeah, it's our identity. Yeah. And it, I remember as a teacher in high school, when kids would say class was boring. Oh, and I, I would believe that. <laughs> yeah, I would say, my class is boring. You students are boring. <laughs> you don't come here doing your homework. You haven't read the material. You bore me stiff. Well, sometimes I think that Catholics who are not living out their baptismal call That's right. are boring. When they say church is boring, they're the ones who brought the boredom in it. That's right. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the concerns that I have yeah. that you guys are answering. 
Well, we have, uh, very often it can be that a, a church, uh, a parish can turn inward. And uh, with Catholic Charities in Tulsa, we give parishes an opportunity to look outside of mm. their, of their mm -hmm. boundary. Uh, the Mass has ended, go. Now, they're going out into the world to serve, and they're going to Catholic Charities to do that service. Mm -hmm. yeah. I know there's one of your Jesuit friends who died some years ago, Father Green, Thomas Green. Oh, yes. Do you remember him? Yes. Uh, he wrote a book. Uh, I've read a number of his books and his retreats. You know, he's a great, he gave a retreat to our priest some years ago and before he died. And, and uh, one of the things he said that I'll never forget is, um, and then he explained it. He said, we, are, um, we do not uh, work for God. We do God's work. In other words, what he's saying is that by our baptism, we and Christ become one. So it's Christ always doing the work. Mm -hmm. And he's using you as his instrument. But that, isn't even, that doesn't even come close to the real unity that you would have with Christ himself. So if you begin to see yourself as Christ, uh, then you, you see that you're not doing a job you're actually doing God's work. You're not working for Him. I thought that, that makes, was. I thought yeah. that was. Uh, it was very helpful to me at the time uh, by Father Green. And you try to communicate this to the volunteers. Mm -hmm. and to you don't even have to well. try really too much. To Is that right? That's why they're there. That's why that they're right? there. That's right. That's yeah, right. That's yeah, why yeah. They're there. And so the the parishes are contributing you know, to this whole process by letting the prisoners know mm -hmm. that there are these opportunities to serve. Mm -hmm. And encourage so. them. Encourage them. them, yeah. When we have Mass every day at Catholic Charities, uh, it's a different pastor or associate pastor from one of our diocesan churches that comes. We don't have one chaplain. We have every pastor and associate pastor come. And so they see the ministries at, at Catholic Charities. Mm -hmm. They take them back to their people and they encourage them. Uh, in, in fact, at our Catholic Charities, the, the, the vast majority of our funds come from our annual appeal. And that is carried out in the parishes uh, by the parish priest, by uh, the uh, individuals there who are donors. Mm -hmm. And again, that's, uh, I think that's a little bit unique. Uh, that's it, a unique story. And if the priests are involved mm -hmm. in being part of it themselves, they won't see this as, you know, a, a one more collection that's an extra burden, but yeah. they'll be involved in encouraging people to be generous. And they are. Mm -hmm. yeah. Our priests are involved in the, in the Catholic Charities yeah. personally, for the, and mainly because they come to say Mass there regularly. Yeah. They take turns. I want to let people know to be sure to tune in to the special documentary that will be spotlighting the work of Catholic Charities of Tulsa later this month on EWTN. The title of the documentary is From the Heart of God, From the Heart of God and Catholic Charities of the Diocese of Tulsa. It'll be shown on Monday, November 21st, at 5.30 a.m. That's for our early crowd, Eastern time. <laughs> and then we also are going to show it again Wednesday, November 23rd at 2.30 p.m. Eastern time. And then on Saturday at uh, November 26th at 6 p.m. Eastern time. So we're going to have three showings of it. We hope that you get a chance to look at it and see for yourself not only to hear from the, uh, these gentlemen what's going on, but to see for yourself the kind of work that they're doing. We need to take a break. We're going to come back in a couple of minutes, and we want to get your comments and your questions too. So please stay with us. My whole experience at Catholic Charities has changed me so much. It's still changing me. Miracles do happen.
found that each of the people that I work with and that I serve, I find that God is truly present within them and God is doing a work through them. And I find that this is the place that I need to be where I can grow most deeply with God in his purpose for my life. Thank you. Thank you and welcome back. Uh, like to welcome a couple of groups that we have as well, some individuals who've come here, one group from New York and another one from Michigan. And we'd love to have you come. If you can come here with your parish or prayer group or other group of folks that can make a trip down here or come as a family or as individuals, we'd love to see you. You can contact our pilgrimage department at 205-271-2966. That's 205-271-2966. Or you can go to our website, www.ewtn.com, and they'll give you all sorts of information and about where you can stay, scheduling for the programs, and you know, scheduling for the masses, a wide variety of other things. And you know, especially with, since we have the, these folks from up north, we'd like to make sure you come here and get some fried green tomatoes and <laughs> all that other good southern cooking. Are you all ready for some questions? Sure, yeah, absolutely. All right, let's uh, uh, go over to a caller. We have uh, Robert on the line. Hello, Robert. Uh, yes. Hi, where are you Hi, from? Mitch. Where are you evening. from? I'm from Jonesboro, Arkansas. Great. And what's your question? Well, I'm interested in knowing the impact and success that your charity has had on the Indian tribes there in eastern Oklahoma, how successful you've been able to reach them. Great question, because Oklahoma is a place where there are many tribal yes. settlements. Yes, we have, a, we have one parish in particular uh, in the diocese in Pawhuska, uh, where the Osage Nation mm -hmm. uh, has been for a long time, and, um, and many of them are Catholic. But beyond that, we have uh, many Native Americans throughout the diocese who are Catholic and who come to the church. However, our, our Catholic Charities goes beyond Tulsa. We have outlets in uh, two or three other places, and many of the people who would come would be, of course, Native American. But we don't ask people whether they're Native American or not. We just, if, if a person has a need, we, we, we deal with that. And on the various reservations, you know, you have parishes yes. that, are, that are doing the various kinds of ministry that needs to be done in the, in the, the uh, Native American communities. Yes. Osage, any other? Tribes, well, there's tribes Cherokee. Cherokee. Yeah, Osage, Cherokee, Creek. There's uh, quite a few uh, Native American tribes, but I would say that Oklahoma is Indian territory, or was uh, before it became a state. And so really much of Oklahoma is populated by Native Americans. Certainly uh, our diocese. Well, certainly, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and so it's not as though they're uh, uh, in a separated community, mm -hmm. they're really uh, across. All over the place. Yes, and so we serve and them you, in all of our offices. recognize most of them mm -hmm. because they've been there for so long, you know, and, and they're right there in, uh, in different just parishes. Just part of the community. Just part of the community, yeah, yep. for it's the most a, part. Yeah. And so a part of our services as well, yes. Yeah. And I bet a lot of volunteers. A lot Absolutely. of volunteers who are Native American, yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. donors. And donors. And donors. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right, we have... Uh, question from our studio. Ma'am, where are you from? I'm from Muskegon, Michigan. Great. Mm -hmm. I love it up there. It's pretty. <laughs> it is. What's your, what's your question? I have a question. I know you all mentioned that um, predominantly you service to non-Catholic individuals. And so with that service, have you seen, though, an increase in vocation, or I'm sorry, an increase in conversions or an increase in your R RCIA programs? Mm -hmm. In uh, Catholic Charities, what we do is we really strive to love people, uh, and certainly then that will bear fruit in itself. Uh, what we don't do is we don't strive to uh, create conversions, and uh, we feel that there's a, a kind of a fine line there, and it's a little bit gray or, or fuzzy perhaps uh, sometimes, and we always struggle with how to develop that, how to understand uh, where that line is. 
Uh, most of the people who we experience will become involved in a Protestant church. As, as you know, only 10% of Oklahoma, or of the Oklahoma, uh, the Tulsa Diocese is Catholic. So we're going to further them. By the way, that's along. a higher percentage than we have here in Alabama. Oh, really? Yes, well, sir. it seems like such a small percentage, uh, but it's a very good community uh, at that. Uh, and so uh, we may plant the seed and then someone else may water it, uh, but certainly uh, God grants the increase in that. Um, we don't specifically strive to create conversions, though. We just strive to love people. So you wouldn't be tracking if there's an increase in RCIA as a result of Catholic charities? No, that's, that's right, we wouldn't. Yeah. On the other hand, out of charity and also vocation, all of us who are Catholic have an obligation to evangelize the world by the way we live, by, exer by practicing our faith uh, and by not apologizing in any way because we happen to be Catholic. On the other hand, part of our faith is to respect the freedom especially religious freedom of every individual. Mm -hmm. But I'm convinced that our Lord Jesus Christ came here for all mankind, for every single individual. And I hope and pray that every single individual in the world can come to the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. I think that's what Jesus came to do. Right. But I don't want anybody coming or even wanting to, uh, anybody coming to the Catholic faith for a wrong reason. Right. I mean, yeah, they, they, they have we to can't tr buy their faith. You cannot buy their faith. You have right. to you have to live your own faith, and uh, and then uh, just trust to the to the Holy Spirit. You do see their faith come alive, though, uh, while they're there. Uh, we have programs, uh, Sister Mary Claire, uh, with uh, Stand in the Gap, where people will say, "I'm ready for uh, an opportunity to uh, to grow in my faith," and uh, Monsignor Gallus will come out. He'll do a Bible study with them. Uh, we'll have Stand in the Gap come and work with them uh, to explore their faith, to journey with a family in, uh, in growth in that way. And so uh, when people walk into a caseworker's office and say, you know, what is that rosary about or why do you have that statue of Mary? We are right on that answer. We, okay. really, we really take up on that. So you don't hide the faith? No. Oh, not at all. Not at all. And we, we welcome those questions, uh, but we don't uh, in any way try and employ um, our services as a means of trying to gain So you confidence. neither shove it down their throat nor do you avoid it. Absolutely. You, you sort of like baby bears porridge, you try to do it just right. <laughs> That's right. And we, it's and it's yeah. difficult to do that at times uh, to you know, try and find the balance. You have to leave balance. space for the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Preach it, because He's the only one who's going to convert anybody. That's exactly. Well, I want to give exactly. you an example. Yeah. Can I give you an example? Please. Early on, some year, five or six years ago, first time I went through St. Elizabeth's Lodge, which is transition housing for families. So, the, uh, how, so families who don't have a place to live, they, live they can come and stay in St. Right. Elizabeth's Lodge. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And so there was this man with a hammer or a saw or something working there, and I uh, was introduced or introduced myself, I forget which. But he had been a previous uh, client. Uh, he had lived there and gotten back on his feet, and he was coming back now to help uh, uh, St. Elizabeth's Lodge. And as he told me the story, he started crying. I mean, th that's the impact. Yeah, sure, sure. We have another caller on the line. Hello, John. Hello, Father. Hi, where are you from? Ohio. And your question? Uh, quick comment. God bless all you men and women of God. You're doing a beautiful work. I remember in the charismatic renewal, 60s, 70s, 80s, there was kind of an interdenominational unity. Now, I was in Columbus at the time finishing up school, and I live in Cleveland. And I think it varies from place to place uh, how much unity there can be. And I just wanted to ask if there were any non-Catholic Christians uh, that, that help, maybe not directly, but in a good way. And thank you. Thank you, John. We have many uh, non-Catholic volunteers who come to serve. They find that uh, at their church um, there might not be an organized uh, way to reach out in charity, and so they will uh, do that through Catholic Charities. Okay. Uh, we find that uh, we can partner uh, with other uh, denominations on programs that we offer or uh, on um, ways that they can help reach out.
Okay. Uh, in Pryor last year, as a small town uh, outside of uh, Tulsa, about 60 miles, the parish priest asked if we could bring uh, coats and uh, Christmas f uh, food baskets and so forth. And when he began that process, the people in the town kind of looked a little suspect at the Catholic Church. But by the end of it, everyone was cheering on the Catholic Church, all the other denominations, and how can we get involved and how can we help. Sure. And so uh, what we find is that charity is a point of unity because need is universal. We're all in need in, in one way or another. And so when we, when we lay that out there and uh, try and chart a path, uh, the Catholic Church, even in a small mission diocese, we can be the leaders to bring uh, many faith groups together. Right, right. We have another question from our studio audience. Father, where are you from? Connecticut. And your question? How did this miracle ever come about? Why do you call it a miracle? Because it's so unique that number one, it's Catholic, and number two, that it seems to be so well organized, and then three, that you're providing all this service. Well, in all humility, Father, I have to say that when I came to Tulsa 18 years ago, uh, that vision of Catholic Charities was, was already there. My previous bishop and the bishop before him had the same vision of making it truly charity and not receiving uh, funds from the government in any way. And so uh, that's part of the reason. So it's the Holy Spirit was in a special way involved, uh, involved in our diocese, I think, for many years and has directed us in this direction. Uh, then, of course, we had the physical need. Our, 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 our uh, places were falling apart, you know, so we had to do something. Uh, they were literally dangerous. Uh, so uh, that's when we had the campaign, and that I think it's really to, uh, the one to thank is our Blessed Mother, because we, uh, at the very beginning of the campaign, we, we put this all in her hands and said, well, we weren't sure we would succeed, but if, it's, if, I, if our Blessed Mother is in charge of this entire endeavor, we will succeed, and we yeah. did. Great. And, and I would just throw in a, a plug, if I could, for uh, Pope Benedict. Uh, the Holy Spirit used Pope Benedict uh, to write, uh, God is love, uh, Deus Caritas Est, and it's really kind of the philosophical operating manual for Catholic Charities in Tulsa. Uh, it, is, uh, it is the miracle that allows us to do the work uh, that we do in our diocese. Yes. And I think uh, if anyone w would get one of our uh, DVDs, which we'll, you will show on, on television right. uh, next, uh, you will see that uh, it, it, all, it, re it reflects this encyclical, his first encyclical, God is love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we'll, we'll uh, make sure that we give a, an address. Uh, people can get that DVD from the Diocese of Tulsa, is that correct? Free. Free! Free. Folks, the price is right. <laughs> all, they, all, they, all they have to do is contact us by email or all otherwise. Right. Let me, we'll, let we'll me give some phone them. numbers and emails. Uh, the Catholic Charities of Tulsa is at 918-949-HOPE. So 918-949-4673, or it spells out hope. Uh, or you can go to the website, which is www.catholiccharitiestulsa.org. Catholic Charities Tulsa, one word, dot org. Now, let me just explain something to you. You better have some people at the phones tomorrow. <laughs> operators when you open by. up, operators will be standing by and have people checking that email. Well, that's a happy problem. <laughs> good, good, good. Let's go to another question from our studio audience. Ma'am, where are you from? I'm from the Philippines. My husband and I are currently visiting my aunts in New York, and we have been privileged to join their group. Bishop, my question is, believing that it is better to teach a man how to fish rather than to give fish outright. Can you please enlighten me if you are currently doing this in Oklahoma? Well, we do both. If a person is hungry, they don't have time uh, to learn how to fish, so you have to give them the fish. However, that's the uniqueness of Catholic Charities in Tulsa 
is that we don't say goodbye then, we've just given you fish. You stay with us and what else do you need? And we provide them uh, even education. Mm -hmm. uh, so we do that. What kind of educational opportunities? English as, a second, uh, as another language, GEDs, uh, computer skills, Help me out, Kevin. Uh, and we have all kinds of uh, classes on cooking, nutritional, uh, how to deal oh, with yeah, your children. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Very important. We bring in uh, lots of different speakers. Again, all volunteers. We have no paid staff to provide uh, classes. What we do is we go out to the bank and say, you have a teller. Uh, could you loan us that person so that we can teach a financial planning class, how to balance your checkbook and things of that nature. Uh, we do uh, not strive, we, don't, we do not seek to have people become dependent upon Catholic Charities. We're a very small organization and so they need to be independent and we work towards that independence for them at St. Elizabeth's Lodge or Madonna House, our maternity residential program. Uh, but at the same time we also know that some people will never gain independence. They mm -hmm. are, yeah. they, they have a disability, uh, they have an issue where they just won't be able to live on their own. And so we're there to be their friend. We're there to be Christ to them. And we're there to see Christ in them. Uh, and so we'll have a long-term relationship with some people. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll, be, we'll be lucky because of that. You know, sure. we'll, we'll be very, um, uh, we'll be much better off because of that. Yeah, okay. We have another question from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? Well, I'm from Pittsfield, Massachusetts via New York City. Mm -hmm. Good for you, good for <laughs> you. <laughs> Good to have you. And what's your question? Well, I have more of an observation. I, I was very impressed with the model that you have in place, which seems to be very successful. And that model is basically that your spiritual priorities in, are number one with you. There's mass every day, there's adoration, and you encourage everybody to live like Christ does. And it seems by doing that, everything else has fallen in line from financial need. You know, you mentioned that, that development program that raised so much money and it seems like you're delivering the service to the needy the, the way it should be and to me that's not just a model for Catholic charities it's a model I think for other Catholic organizations so that on the one side the other observation is not that I've been involved with too many other Catholic charities but I think a lot of other Catholic charities have made the statement of social justice for social justice sake and, and have, put, have, put the, have sort of put the spiritual priorities on the side and I think that's caused an issue. Oh, okay, good. Do you have any comments? Well, I do think that uh, by putting the, the spiritual first, then God provides uh, the rest. Uh, I would also say that uh, the poor we will always have with us and the needs are overwhelming. It's, uh, I, just before we left to come here, it was raining in Tulsa that morning. There were- uh, much, much welcome rain too yes, after that's the drought right. that you've had this yes, year. Yes, thank God for the rain. Uh, and yet uh, there were people standing out there in the rain waiting to be served and it's, it's heartbreaking to see that. Uh, so uh, we have a good model, uh, but I do think that uh, the need is incredible and we're always striving to do better in, in terms of resource development. Mm -hmm. But it comes because of God's gift. And I'd like to add what he just said, you know, that we, we do not take care of everyone's needs. We physically are unable to do that. However, people do line up and we have to close the door when we run out. Right. And this breaks your heart because we love these people and, and, um, and they have to go back home without our help. And, but then we're, we survive because we pray and we know in our hearts that we would do, we would do more if we could. And so uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, they have to go home hungry. And so when we go to Mass and, and pray to our Lord and tell Him, uh, please help us so that we can help these people, it brings joy to our hearts even though we're not doing a perfect job. Uh, we just, we want to do better. Right. right. And that's why the spiritual is so important. It's important for us. Uh, for your own sustenance yes. through the difficult times yes. of you know, trying to serve more. Right. If you don't have a well-developed interior life, and we always struggle with that, uh, but if we don't have a well-developed interior life, uh, it, it's just something that you're just going to burn out on. Uh, sure, sure. Uh, wor work in charity because it's a, a never-ending task, and it's uh, very difficult to see how broken the world is. 
sometimes that's a temptation. I think that the last questioner was mentioning that if you so focus on social justice through a political prism, you see it as a political issue mm -hmm. primarily, then you, you, are, you, you can, if you're not careful, you can end up running on anger yeah, exactly. instead of running on love. And joy. And joy, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and that's one of the things, you know, that uh, is a, a nuance where we, you know, justice for people is important. Yes, certainly. But you can't sustain yourself on anger over injustice. No. We're not driven by ideology. Uh, right, right on the very front of our uh, altar at Catholic Charities uh, in Immaculate Conception Chapel, it says, Caritas Christi Urgit Nos. The charity of Christ urges us on. It's not ideology that urges us on. It's, it's, it's the person of Jesus. Christ. Right. Yeah. And right. that's what we have to stay focused on. Okay, we have another caller, Nabil. Hello. Hi, Nabil, where are you from? Uh, hi, Father. I'm uh, from Michigan. Great. And what's your question? Well, I wanted to ask, what is the criteria for qualifying for Catholic Relief Services? I mean, there are a lot of people out there who are not destitute, who are not, quote, unquote, poor. But these are working people who are just struggling to make their monthly payments, whether it's house payment, car payment, credit card. Can, can someone like that get help, or do you have to be, you know, homeless? Many of the people that we serve at our Catholic Charities are what I would call the working poor. There are people who um, have a job, but maybe their car breaks down. And if their car breaks down, then they're choosing between fixing their car or eating. And they can't not eat. Uh, right. But if they don't fix their car, they lose their job. And so then you have a spiral, uh, an uncontrollable spiral for those people. And it creates a terrible situation for them. And so what we do at Catholic Charities is we evaluate the person's need when they walk in and we say, here is a way that we can become involved in, in your life and help you get over this, this hump and, and move on so that you'll regain your independence and right. you'll maintain your dignity, the dignity right. of the person. And just as uh, an example of what had happened uh, and we hadn't talked about this in a long time, but a, a number of years ago, decades ago, a, a family walked in with that very need and they, they had to uh, just get over the hump. Well, uh, that family grew up. Uh, the, the young lady uh, in that family, the, the little girl, uh, passed away and she left us a multi-million dollar gift. Um, Two and, million, I think. Yeah, $2.7 million $2 dollars in the million end. Dollars. Uh, and that was because uh, she saw that in that time of need, we evaluated their situation. And this is, this is 30 years ago. This wasn't me or, or Bishop or, or uh, Rich. This, this has been going on in this diocese for decades. Right. Uh, right. And when you respond to their needs and say, even though you're not completely homeless, we're still going to work with you, uh, then, then you find that there's uh, fruits from that. Yeah. I, I just like one little example. I didn't, I never thought about this before, but, um, one of the dentists mentioned to me that when you're poor, uh, you generally don't have enough money or insurance to get your teeth taken care of. Some people who are as qualified as the next person can't get a job because of the appearance of their teeth. Sure, sure. So uh, if you can fix their, just something that's, that we, we take for granted. Sure. But if, if the dentist fixes their teeth and, they, and they feel better, they're healthier and they look better, they, they then are on a par for applying for a job and getting it because of their qualifications. Sure. They're not disqualified because of their appearance. And we have that in, in so many ways. It could be Rachel's Vineyard, where you have an individual who uh, has a job, who's married, who ha maybe even has kids, but they are not a whole person because they've never healed from that, that abortion. Right. Uh, we have people who uh, come and they're not a whole family because they have not been able to have children. Right. Uh, but through Catholic Charities Adoption Services, we help to make them whole. And so our services run the spectrum uh, in terms of financial, um, in terms of spiritual, in terms of material support. Uh, we really try and, and look at every person as an individual and then deal with all of their needs. Well, thank you all. Uh, we've run out of time. Uh, thank you all for being with us. 
Uh, it's a great story, Thank and you, it's uh, hopefully a model for a lot of others. Bishop, would you give us your blessing? Yes. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain forever. Amen. 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 And, you know, we can bring you these guests and do the documentary special that we're going to be showing to you in a few weeks because this network is brought to you by you. But we need you to keep on supporting us. So keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill, and we'll be able to pay all our bills. God bless you and thank you.